So, um, what we're going to do today is advance kind of through the, these golden years of barbershop. Um, this was the time when male quartets were very popular in the country. They were the, the, the top quartets were the top recording artists. The top entertainment was vaudeville, where you would see a quartet. There was also something later called the Circuit Chautauqua, which featured quartets. I'll talk about that later. There were also people now hearing music in their homes, starting to mimic it. Uh, there were quartets everywhere. Um, the quartet tradition after the turn of the century, as we sort of learned, began to wane a little bit with African Americans who gravitated, began to gravitate towards other kinds of music, but it didn't stop, let me emphasize that. It just became very popular in white society. And what with all the recording artists putting out all this stuff, uh, people had a piano in their parlor, they sat around singing, life wasn't complicated, you didn't have movies to go to, the only thing there was was a vaudeville show that came around every once in a while. And so your entertainment in the evening was to sit around, talk, and sing. So, <clears throat> The year is now 1910, and this song plays on the stereotypes of the barbershop chord. Now, uh, <clears throat> the man that you see on the sheet music is Burt Williams, who, and this is an interesting story, you can look him up in uh, Wikipedia. He was a vaudevillian, he had a vaudeville act, where he put on blackface. So that was a throwback already by this time because uh, uh, it, was, it hearkened to minstrelsy. Minstrelsy was no longer the thing. It was the vaudeville show by now. But lots of vaudeville acts were throwback things. So it was like this was, you know, people recognize it as a minstrel act. Al Jolson also did this, by the way. In his early days, he put on blackface and performed live. Interesting thing about Burt Williams is he was a black man, all right? So in some ways, this might have been his, his cover. Uh, when he put on black bass, people didn't know he was a black man. <laughs> now, this, this song is interesting unto itself as well. Um, some of you may know it. Um, there is a society arrangement of it. It was also sung by Gotcha a few years ago when they, uh, in, in their gold medal performance. The song talks about uh, a rathskeller and a piano player, who is obviously a black man, and a black woman who wants him to play that barbershop chord. The song was recorded uh, and made the top of the charts in 1910, and the recording was by the American Quartet. That's the one whose lead is Billy Murray. We were introduced to those yesterday. And um, <coughs> there's all kinds of stopping and starting in this. Twice they stop to freeze a chord, and then they talk. And again in dialect, they say, that's it, that's what, that's the barbershop chord. The chord they freeze both times is a seventh chord. So that's kind of interesting, that in 1910, the barbershop chord was recognizable as the seventh chord. And the other thing is the African-American connotation. The barbershop chord is clearly associated with black harmonizers. So, uh, the s lyrics of the song are not uh, uh, something that would be appropriate today. Uh, talks about a kinky-haired lady they called Chocolate Sadie. That was the female character. That's what the lead says, all right? So, here we go. Play it in its entirety, because I think it's very interesting. Down in a breezy left field, a rare grim color field, a fine and game of milk, here for the Lord, Christian, a white singer's song. You can come and take a whole night long, Oh, 
So that's enlightening, don't you think? That tells us what people's stereotype was at that time. Um, there were male quartets all over the place. They weren't barbershop quartets by label. The barbershop chord was something that was found in a Rathskeller uh, in a place where African Americans hung out. The song is sung in black dialect. Yeah? I talked about Tin Pan Alley. <clears throat> what was Tin Pan Alley? I believe the year is, was 1909, and that's in your notes because there's a blurb about Tin Pan Alley. Uh, there was a, a journalist, uh, his name was Monroe Rosenberg? Rosenfeld. Rosenfeld. Yes. And he wrote a series of articles about the song publish in, pu publishing industry that was blurgeoning in New York City. Now, all the publishers were set up on one street. And it was on 28th Street. Now, those of you, I don't know, anybody here from New York? Okay. Well, I went to graduate school at Columbia, so I'm sort of um, familiar with New York geography. But you know, uh, so here's Manhattan. You know how Broadway kind of comes down the west side, and then af below Central Park, it goes at an angle all the way across. So it hits all the avenues at an angle. And um, <clears throat> it cuts off a little corner of 28th Street and 5th Avenue. So there's a little triangle there that it cuts off. So 28th Street is the north boundary of that triangle, that little, little part of 28th Street. That's where all the publishers were set up. And um, that's what it looked like in 1900. And he, he entitled his sequence of articles Tin Pan Alley because when he walked down the street, all these composers were plunking on pianos and so it made a cacophony that, he, that reminded him of, of pots and pans banging around in a kitchen. So his articles were entitled Tin Pan Alley. And that name stuck and became synonymous with the song publishing industry even after it was no longer on 28th Street and even after it kind of moved out of New York City. Uh, people still referred to American song publishing as Tin Pan Alley. So Tin Pan Alley was churning out songs by the thousands. These composers just sat in their studio plunking out tunes, hoping for that hit. And of course a hit would be uh, if you could find some good recording artist uh, to sing it and therefore people would hear it, they would love it. They had other methods of, of pushing their songs. They hired song pushers. In fact, Irving Berlin began his musical career as a song pusher. They were singing waiters. Uh, they would stand in public places on a balcony and try to round up people, sing a song, and get people to sing along. They would also be planted in the musical theater. So if there's a musical review, it ends with some song and the curtains close and somebody in the audience stands up as if so enthralled that he has to continue singing and waves his hands and tries to get the audience to sing along in one final refrain of the chorus. So these people were paid and they were called song pushers. Uh, that's one of the ways these publishers tried to get their songs out there. You have to understand that for each hit there probably were a thousand songs that went into obscurity. For many, many years, we feel it was viewed that, <clears throat> it was felt that to get a good barbershop song, you had to go combing through Tin Pan Alley songs. And even though there are thousands of them, we know what the hits were. <laughs> we know them. Those were the ones that had some sort of hook as a song that made it interesting. For each one of those, there's many, many songs that were just generic. They just had nothing, I mean, they were okay songs, the rhyme, they had a good form, but nothing in it that would make you want to sing it. So um, our arranging languished, I think, for many years in the 70s and 80s because we were just looking for more and more Tin Pan Alley songs. 
Therefore, I welcome what's going on nowadays with reaching back before then and certainly after then. Many great songs of the 30s and 40s are now sung in barbershop and songs right up until, you know, right up, uh, that were written right up until recently. And uh, I think that's a good thing. And it really coincides with what barbershoppers have done over the decades. Okay, so that's Tin Pan Alley. There's the, uh, so not just producing the tunes, but the artwork on the cover of these old big pieces of sheet music was very important. So they hired artists to come up with this artwork. So if it was a song about some sentimental thing, about Dixie or something, and there was a picture of a southern farm or something, you know. <clears throat> now, musical trends were changing. You can tell the Tin Pan Alley songs from um, songs of the 1800s. There is more harmonic variety in them. You know, Stephen Foster's songs tended to be a bit triadic. Um, but all of a sudden, the African mu American musicians were taking European uh, harmonic practices and combining them with their own polyrhythmic effects, which probably came from Africa. And this spawned forms like, like ragtime. We talked a little bit about Joplin before. He, he, uh, his life work was Tremonitia, the opera, but of course that's not what people know him for. They know him for his rags. And these rags were just incredible pieces of, you know, uh, rhythm and harmony. So here's one of his rags that you'll recognize. But now listen to this. Try to put yourself shortly after the turn of the century when people were singing songs like Sweet Rosie O'Grady and they began to hear this. There was no rhythm like this in the 1800s. And you hear the little pre-beat. That. That's why they called it ragtime. So, trained musicians thought this was actually vulgar. It was just not for decent people. And of course, it was played in low-life places. It didn't come from New York City. It came floating up the river from God-forsaken places like, you know, Kansas City, St. Louis, New Orleans, all those places that had no respectability at all. Listen to that offbeat, that's just great. We're so used to it, we take it for granted, but this is incredibly creative. Here's another guy, UB Blake. Uh, in 1910, they, they had a ragtime piano playing contest in New York City. And that was a big deal, because it was sort of an admission that this music had made it out there, and so we might as well honor it by having a, a piano playing contest. That contest was won by UB Blake. I actually, and he, he uh, won it playing his own composition. It was called the Charleston Rag. Not the Charleston, but the Charleston Rag. I'll play a little piece of that. It's a great piece of music. And uh, I actually had the chance of meeting UB Blake in the early 80s. He came to Washington University and, and, and played a concert. Uh, and uh, I stood around to shake that man's hand after uh, he had entertained us. And I have to say, it was the biggest hand I've ever seen. I, th I think he could play three octaves in one hand, you know. He, his fingers were just huge. And he was a tall man, uh, but very engaging. And uh, just, uh, he, he entertained everybody in a very wonderful way for an evening. But anyway, in 1910, here's what his uh, composition sounded like. And this is great stuff. There's ragtime. <laughs> it sort of obscures the beat a little bit. Now he does a great thing with the circle of fifths here. The, these musicians took the circle of fifths and they just had fun with it, you know. Classical musicians did it in a very ponderous way, but the ragtimers just went pow, 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 pow. And Tin Pan Alley picked that up, all right? 
Here we go. It's coming up. Here. Oh, there's a great push. That's fantastic. Okay, listen to this. See? Now, it took Wagner 20 minutes to do that, but he just went, you know? <laughs> That's right. Okay. So the the point is that many of the musical ideas in this music went into popular music. Uh, they were doing all kinds of things like uh, uh, phantom beats. Um, so, toot toot tootsie goodbye, toot toot tootsie don't cry, the choo choo train that takes me, okay? Uh, down on the levee in old Alabama, da 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 da, what's them shuffling along, ba da 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 da. Those rhythms got to be just inbred into Tin Pan Alley music. Those didn't exist in popular music before ragtime gave it the idea. And so it affected our music profoundly. Certainly a person who had huge influence on our music is Irving Berlin. He was the one who really started picking up the ragtime musical elements and putting them into his songs. In fact, in the years between 1910 and 1920, Irving Berlin was known as the ragtime composer. Um, yeah, I and mean, we don't think of his music as being ragtime, but, you know, he just started doing all these rhythmic things. So, um, he was, uh, his, I think he, his family came over here when he was about five years old. There's a nice paragraph in your notes about Irving Berlin. It's an interesting story. His name was Israel Balin, and when he began writing music and became popular, he changed his name to Irving Berlin, like many people did, just because Israel Balin, uh, there was probably prejudice against Jewish people, and he didn't want it to sound so Jewish, unfortunately. So um, he became Irving Berlin to us and to the world, and he began writing tunes. As I said, he began as a singing waiter. He was a song pusher. He also taught himself music on keyboard. I can't remember if I talked about that in this class or not, but he liked to play on the black keys. His favorite key was F sharp. Every other keyboard is worse key. And uh, in order to be able to play an F sharp, he had uh, what was then called a sliding piano board. Pianos came with, certain pianos had a sliding board. So if you wanted to play in, uh, G, rather than F sharp, you just took the board and slid the uh, strings over so that now when you hit F sharp, it actually played G, and then he played his song in whatever key he wanted to. So uh, he was probably the most prolific songwriter, some would say the greatest in American history, but for sure he had the most hits. Irving Berlin had huge numbers of hits. And, um, you know, Gershwin, of course, was a great songwriter, too, and maybe his music is more distinguished, but he didn't have this many hits. Uh, can, when you consider how many hits Irving Berlin had, and also the decades over which he continued to write music, he was producing hits up until 1960. So from 1910 to 1960, 50 years of being right on the cutting edge of songwriting that's a long time. So he was very adaptable. He knew when something was passe and he was willing to move on. So the same guy that wrote Mandy and Me wrote uh, Putting on the Ritz, you know. <clears throat> this was his first big hit. Doesn't really have a lot of ragtime in it, does it? A little bit of da 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 It's got a little bit of phantom beat. So it's kind of ragtimey, but not much. Most of it sings more like a march. But here's what was significant. It had the word ragtime in it, and it was a hit. And so it legitimized the term. 
There had been a few references to ragtime before in pop songs, like Hello My Baby, Hello My Honey, Hello My Ragtime Gal. But uh, that probably was sort of a reference to this woman that she wasn't uh, too terribly respectable, actually. Um, but this was Alexander's Ragtime Band was portrayed on the sheet music. And of course, this, this is, uh, you can see this is much later. It, this is a later copy of it. But I believe this was the original artwork. So there's a bunch of white guys playing in a, in a park. Um, so everything was on the up and up, and ragtime was kind of okay after that. This is kind of funny. <coughs> um, <laughs> now, the reason I show that slide is to emphasize the point that quartetting was not just a professional thing. That's what made it popular. It was practiced by the people. I think I talked a little bit yesterday or the day before about the duality of barbershop. It's entertainment, and it's also something that people do to entertain themselves. Sometimes you do it to entertain yourself. Sometimes you do it to entertain an audience. Barbershop quartets, or male quartets, not, as I said, not everybody used the term barbershop, were everywhere. And organizations had quartets under their auspices. That include churches, clubs, businesses, organizations, uh, and even, believe it or not, baseball teams. Baseball teams tended to have a quartet. And so there they are harmonizing around home plate, or out there at third base, maybe. <clears throat> This guy, anybody heard the name Ring Lardner? Probably nobody on this side of the room, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you are again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so he was a writer. He was largely a sports writer, but he also wrote short stories. And in 1915, I believe it was, he wrote an article for McClure's Magazine, and it was called Harmony. And it was about a baseball team, believe it or not, even though the article was Harmony, because it was about the team's quartet. So it was told from the point of view of a guy who was a scout. He was not only a scout, he was a player. That was back when players quite often had managerial roles or business roles in the team as well. So he was uh, you know, maybe an outfielder or something, but he was also the scout. And he was the baritone in the baseball te uh, team's quartet. Now, the conflict of the story is that the pitcher was the tenor. One of the pitchers was the tenor, and he was kind of an aging pitcher. He was getting to where he was washed up, and it was felt like he was going to not be on the team all that much longer. And so the stress was, what are we going to do for a tenor? Now, in the process of his scouting, he manages to recruit this young outfielder who gets hired and turns out to be phenomenal. As a tenor and as an outfield. Yeah, that, you, you preempted me a little bit there. So uh, what they learn is, through some twists and turns, they learn that the scout actually wasn't even in the ballpark at the time he was supposed to have scouted out this player. And so the question was, how did you know to recruit him? In fact, he didn't know he was a very good ball player. He knew he was a good tenor. All right, so that's why he was recruited. Uh, we saw this uh, slide before, but this one comes with a, a sound bite. Um, as we uh, said, he sang in a quartet when he was a youth. He sang in Storyville on the streets. Storyville is part of New, New Orleans that no longer exists, by the way. Um, and there's a couple of great books. I absolutely love the story of the beginning of jazz in New Orleans. And uh, these two biographies of Louis Armstrong are just fantastic. If you want a good read, get either one of them and read it. You don't, you do, you don't just learn about Louis Armstrong. You learn about um, the beginning of jazz and all the other jazz greats that he came in contact with. He was born around... 1900, that says 1901, but nobody, including him, was ever sure when he was born. Um, about 1920, he uh, left New Orleans, 
because his former mentor, Joe Oliver, had left New Orleans, gone up the river to Chicago, and was playing New Orleans jazz in Chicago, where it made a huge hit. And he brought Louis up there to play in Chicago. So that launched his career. This is a little clip from the Hot Four. Their combo in Chicago was called the Hot Four. And it's fun to listen to the counterpoint. I told you that when people ask Louis Armstrong the difference between singing and playing, he said playing is singing. There's all kinds of these online. Those of you arrangers, Patrick, just download all this stuff and listen. You'll get a million ideas. This musical fun from beginning to end. All right, we'll move on. <laughs> Columbia Colored Quartet. This is a, as it says, a rare recording of an African American quartet a little later in the 20th century. This is from 1921. The song is I'm Just Wild About Moonshine. And the thing that distinguishes this from the other uh, recordings we've listened to of groups like the Haydn, the Peerless, and the American Quartet is that this one is a little more, a little closer to the street, a little closer to the people. This was not a studio quartet. There weren't black professionals singing in the studio at that time. And so this was an honest quartet. They came off the street somewhere and Columbia decided to, that there was a market for their music, probably amongst African Americans, and they wanted to record them. Uh, it's difficult to understand. The quality isn't good, uh, so I wrote down the, the lyrics as best I could. Um, and so let's listen to this. This is interesting in several ways, so let me just mention a few things to listen for. Listen to the fact that the bass gives a non-lyric propellant through large portions of the song. All right? It starts with a non-lyric intro, just nonsense syllables, and then those appear again near the end of the song. It does a little interpret, it, it takes part of the song and makes a rap out of it. <laughs> and then it, it, it inserts a song that has the melody of Bill Grogan's Goat, except it's, it's And When I Die. So, which fits the lyrics of this song just fine. So let's uh, listen and, and read along. Again, highlighting the lead voice. Hear what the bass is doing? Hi, Julia. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very telling recording. Some recordings are very significant in my mind. One was the uh, 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 barbershop, play that barbershop chord, just because of what it told us about people's attitude, you know. But this one is, is really good because this is clearly a repertoire song. This is the way these guys sang it, right? They got brought into the studio to sing something they were already singing. It wasn't made up for the studio. And so um, 
That gives you a little glimpse into barber shopping in the year 1921. And that's rather late in barber shops' life, especially for African Americans. They were gravitating more towards gospel, eventually, you know, uh, uh, other, other kinds of music, eventually doo-wop, of course. The barber shop amongst blacks, you didn't find so much of after 1920. It did exist, though. It did exist, as we'll see. <clears throat> so a lot of the quartets that were African-American were singing gospel tunes, but they really had barbershop elements in them. Um, the fellow Lynn Abbott, I told you about Lynn Abbott, didn't I, who wrote the defining article. The reason he, Lynn Abbott had never heard of barbershop harmony. And he was researching, but he's very interested in the music of the African American. He was researching the gospel groups and the old black singers that used to sing gospel in this age, in the 30s, kept mentioning the word barbershop. Said, we took a lot of our harmony from barbershop. And Lynn Abbott didn't know what that meant. So he started researching barbershop and found out more about the history of barbershopping than anybody in the society ever had. I mean, his article put us to shame. He really found out things that nobody knew. In fact, it had been said, when I got into barbershop, it was believed, Dave Stevens always said this, that the first printed reference to barbershop was the song, the 1910 song, Play That Barbershop Chord. But of course, Lynn Abbott found lots of references from the 1890s where the people were reviewing the black vaudeville quartets that freely used the term barbershop to describe the quartet and to describe the harmony. You'll hear a little bit of that, what they call close harmony in this, uh, from the Morris Brown Quartet, recorded in 1939, uh, clearly a microphone recording. Moody blind man stood on the road and cried. You notice the just intonation, too. Listen to the thirds and sevenths, how they're a little low. Listen to this seventh hit. which is the lead baritone in that chord. I, I may have those switched. So this is the Shine On Me out of a hymn book. A lot of people <laughs> that come into barbershop think Shine On Me is a barbershop song and, and don't recognize it as a hymn. Uh, there's no way I could not recognize it as a hymn because I kind of grew up Bible Belt. My right. daddy was a circuit-riding circuit preacher, and uh, so this was in the hymn book. Um, but Shine on Me is a hymn. It's a metaphor. It's Shine on Me. The light is the God or the truth or whatever. Uh, the verse... My ship is sailing. This is, this is a well-known metaphor in, in, you know, fundamentalist uh, religions for your ship is your life and if you're sailing you're you're lost so uh, it's a plea sometimes sometimes the lyrics is written captain rather than Jesus and that further obscures the fact that it's a hymn but it is not a nautical song it's a hymn <laughs> okay so let the lighthouse shine its golden beams on me may I find the truth may I find God so this is the way it appears in the hymn book and you can see that it doesn't have all of our barbershop isms in it. Uh, uh, but the, when I grew up, there were lots of male quartet songs in the hymn book. And they were indicated, that male treble clef was indicated by that symbol right there. I don't know if you've ever seen that. But, but that, actually, we should use that because that's the one we use. That says <laughs> that it's not the honest treble clef, that middle C is right there rather than down there. Okay, so that's the clef we use. So that's a symbol, an old-timey symbol that indicates. That's why you could, in the hymn book, tell the male quartet arrangements from the, uh, from the others. And you notice it, it does have the melody in the second tenor. It's not exactly the melody we sing. Barbershoppers morphed it like they do everything else. 
So this was the Avon Comedy 4, and particularly, this is not a very good photocopy, but Charles Dale and Joseph Smith were, that's not the LDS Joseph Smith, uh, the, uh, were, were a, a famous comedy team by themselves. Um, and you'll see, you'll see a couple references to Smith and Dale in future uh, discussions. This was from the uh, book Vaudeville, 1953, by Joe Laurie. Uh, and it says he writes in a style of a letter to a friend reminiscing about the good old days of uh, three a day, which is a vaudeville term, three shows a day. And so he's talking about the vaudeville days. And it's a very revealing discussion he has because he talks about how prominent the quartet was in the vaudeville circuit. And he does use the term barbershop. So look at this paragraph here. One of the surefire singing acts was the old-fashioned quartet. I mean the close harmony singers, the barbershop quarters, who use no microphones. And he says there were two kinds of quartets. There were the straight quartets, and then there, there were the comedy quartets. Okay? The idea of comedy, parody, in barbershop is not new. Some were serious. They want to touch you with the, the lyrics or the rhythm. Some are trying to be funny. <clears throat> and then uh, he, he talks about you know, certain stereotypes of, of, the, of the singers. It's kind of fun to read. Um, says the Bison City Quartet lasted the longest, remaining together from 1891 to 1931. How about that? 50 years. With just a few changes in personnel. Let me move on. Oh, and you notice he has a picture there of the Avon Comedy Four. They were the most famous one, probably. And here's something, uh, he, he, he lists some, the Empire Comedy Four um, were a standard comedy quartet, as were the Arlington Comedy Four. Uh, it mentions the personnel. Roberts was an African American. Uh, and I believe this is the first time one was in a white vaudeville act. Interesting statement. Um, Manhattan Comedy 4, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> there was a quartet called That Quartet. Yes. <laughs> and here's a good, he says, there were many more male groups, but there were a few female quartets that are worth mentioning. So there were female quartets in vaudeville. Didn't start with Sweet Adelines. Um, the four Haley sisters. The four Cook sisters, get this, this quartet, a name copy of that male quartet. <laughs> and another outfit called themselves that other quartet. ABC quartet, Swedish American quartet, the military girls quartet, the four Rubini sisters, many, many more. So you see that the vaudeville quartet tradition was varied, it was rich, and it included both genders. This is a quartet, the Euterpian Quartet, and I need to get a sound bite because you can get them. A popular women's quartet around 1901, and they were not a vaudeville quartet. They were a concert quartet. It says they sang at the funeral of President William McKinley. There they are. Yeah, this is interesting. Okay, this is a letter, this is an honest letter to Joe Laurie, the guy who authored that book about vaudeville. It is dated... June 5th, 1946, but it's talking about the beginning of the song, Sweet Adeline. Now, this might be of special interest to Sweet Adelines in the room, of which we have a couple, at least. Um, the name Sweet Adeline was probably uh, dubbed to the women harmonizers by the men, actually, because when our society began, it wasn't long before women who came to the conventions were going off in the corner and singing the same songs or tags in their own key. Just pitch it up and sing the same thing. And they were referred to by the men as the Sweet Adelines over there because the Sweet, Sweet Adeline was such a popular barbershop song. In fact, from the get-go of when it was published, which was um, about 1903, it says here, that song was identified with Barbershop Quartet. So this letter is interesting. 
it's, it's, it's written by the author of Sweet Adeline, by the composer. Harry Armstrong composed the song Sweet Adeline. And um, he said he met Richard H. Gerard, and he, he'd written this tune. He set the tune to the, You're the Flower of My Heart, Sweet Rosalie. And we peddled Sweet Rosalie for two years, but nobody would believe it. I like that sentence. I always had great faith in the chorus melody because we used to harmonize it in the boxing camp after the training stunts were finished. Why does it harmonize so well, the chorus of the song? Call and response. Call and response. It does what barbershop does. It's got the lead out and then you can harmonize the echo. One day Gerard and I were walking along Broadway as we saw a, a theatrical sign advertising the farewell appearance of Adelina Patti, famous European opera singer. You can Google her, she was quite famous. And at this point she was nearing the end of her career. So it might have been like a farewell tour. Dick said, Adelina, Adeline, at night dear heart for you I pine. Oh. That was it. He changed the line of the Rosalie song and Whitmark, who is a publisher, accepted it. It was published in 1903 after eight years of being kicked around. <laughs> Smith and Dale, the old Avon Comedy Four, sang it, the most popular vaudeville quartet. So did Harry Cooper, the Empire Comedy Four, John Figg, the Orpheus Comedy Four, Cunningham of the Clipper Four, Willie Howard of the old Messenger Boys Trio, the act was Willie and Gene Howard and Thomas Potter, uh, done. And so I can go on and on. All these vaudeville groups picked it up and began to sing it. It became identified with the quartet almost immediately. And of course it gave our largest women's organization their name. So very significant. Okay, I should say something about the circuit Chautauqua. So, this came about about the same time vaudeville sprang up. It says that it started in 1874. For many years it was just planted on the shore of New York's Lake Chautauqua. What they did is they set up a big tent that you see pictured there and they had a show in there. Was it the same as vaudeville? Well, not quite. It did have comedy acts and musical acts, but it also had a more serious bent to it. So it would have something like a lecture. It could be religious, it could be political. Uh, Williams Jenning, William Jennings Bryant, for example, was a popular lecturer in the Chautauqua. But other comedy acts were there. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, uh, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, ever heard of that, the, the dummy? Uh, Edgar Bergen was the father of Candace Berg Bergen, and um, uh, um, he, he uh, performed on the Chautauqua. A former society historian named Dean Snyder that some of you may recall, who actually helped me a lot in getting this course together, he's now passed away, uh, began singing Barbershop Harmony on the Chautauqua. So the Chautauqua began to travel. Since it was a tent, it could go anywhere. And then, of course, it became not just one tent, but any old traveling tent show was known generically as a Chautauqua. So Chautauquas traveled around in the summertime, set up uh, their tent outside of towns, and people would go out there and see the show. So it was another important venue for the male quartet or the barbershop quartet. And this really was in its heyday, say, after 1900 as a traveling show. But we should understand that, that some people who were interested in barbershop harmony or male quartet harmony actually did use the word barbershop. And it came to be used more and more into the 1920s. I'll talk about some works of people like Jeffrey O'Hara and Sigmund Spaeth who actually used the term barbershop. But around 1905, you would, probably wouldn't have heard barbershop quartet attached to someone like the Hayden Quartet. But you saw in the article about vaudeville, that person did say barbershop quartet. He talked about the barbershop quarters. And it should be said that 
this barbershop quartet phenomenon was ubiquitous. I mean, here's the Whitney brothers. They weren't famous. I just found this slide. Now, actually, I think I got this from Val Hicks, to tell you the truth. They weren't famous like the Hayden Quartet. Now, this is kind of interesting. <clears throat> I think I mentioned Glenn Howard. Did I mention his name? Okay. Just to remind you, Glenn Howard began singing Barbershop when a street corner quartet taught him the bass part to Bright Was the Night in Springfield, Illinois. The year was 1919. And I must have mentioned that that's where we get the song Bright Was the Night. Some people have looked around for a copyrighted song or a published song called Bright Was the Night. There is no such. We don't know where the song came from. It probably came from barbershoppers. Anyway, Glenn got hooked immediately as many people do the first time they hear their voice filling out those chords. And he formed the Oriole Quartet. Notice the spelling. Notice they dubbed themselves a Close Harmony Four. These Illinois harmonizers did not use the term barbershop. In fact, when our society started 20 years later, Glenn Howard's Quartet, which was then the capital city four, went there thinking they were not eligible to compete because they didn't represent a barbershop. Hmm. They got there, O.C. Cash met him in the lobby, heard him sing and said, well, you, not only are you in, you're in the contest, I think you're gonna win it. Hmm. They didn't have even brought their costume, so they sang in their street clothes. Mm -hmm. They placed second. The Bartlesville Barflies were first. The Capital City Four was second at the first contest. That was Glenn Howard. Now, he told me many interesting stories. He's the one that told me that, I think I mentioned this in class, that uh, they tried to, he tried to teach his quartet the new songs, like the Tin Pan Alley 1920s songs, you know. Uh, toot Toot Tootsie, boy, that would have been a hard song. That was not a barbershop song at all. Um, but he would go to the movie slash vaudeville show. So by the 1920s, um, well, to back up a little bit, uh, the vaudeville shows began showing silent movies, maybe even before the turn of the century. As I, t as I mentioned to you, when Thomas Edison inv invented the motion picture uh, projector, um, nobody was much interested in that. But somebody figured out, well, We've got these live show in between, you know, the intermission or whatever, we can show these flicks and it'll kind of keep people entertained. So they began showing silent black and white m movies, shorts, uh, in vaudeville shows. And basically, the history of the movie is, it is vaudeville. When you go to the movie, you're going to vaudeville. Because what happened was the movie began to be more interesting. Pretty soon it had subtitles and a story. You could read what was going on. And the movie became longer, the live act became shorter, pretty soon there was sound, pretty soon there was color, and basically what happened is the live act dwindled away. Even I can remember as a kid going to the movie and there would be some semblance of a live show. There might have been a, a, an MC and an organist. And if you're old enough to remember that, that's vaudeville. It just vanished. The movie took over. Um, anyway. What I was heading for here is that uh, Glenn talked about going to the movie slash show. There still was quite a show and still had quartets coming around in the 1920s. And what he was interested in is seeing the quartet. He mentioned the Avon Comedy Four. He also mentioned another quartet called the Stratford Comedy Four that was his favorite. He and the, let's see. Yeah, Glenn was the first, uh, was the lead. He and the baritone, Floyd, would go to the movie, and back then, if you paid your money to get in, they didn't shoo you away at the end. So you could see the live show, see the movie, you could just stay there, once you paid, you were in. <laughs> so they would watch three viewings of the movie, just so they could hear the quartet sing three times. And it was the same act, but they were interested in lifting their arrangements. So Glenn could sort of, had a shorthand where he could write down chords, and Floyd wrote down the words, and then they would go home and teach their quartet, the Oriole Four. <laughs> yeah. So that's the 1920s version of lifting it off the CD. <laughs> okay, but you notice the card? 
Close Harmony for entertainers for all occasions. He talked about singing at the state fair, singing for weddings, singing for parties, whatever. Much like today. Here's another amateur quartet, Peoria, Illinois, probably around 1913. This was given to me by the daughter of this fellow, John Hansen, who was an early society uh, mover and shaker. And he directed many barbershop courses around the central Illinois area. He, era, he was area. He was the mentor of Floyd Conant, a name that you may recognize. Okay, Floyd Conant learned his barbershopping from John Hansen. Jim Jordan. Well, if you're an old guy like me, you remember Fibber McGee. <laughs> Fibber McGee and Molly was a radio program my mom and dad liked to listen to. And uh, that was Fibber McGee. He later became a nationally famous radio personality. So this was their quartet. And uh, J uh, John's daughter, whose name is Betty Oliver, she was a prominent Sweet Adeline arranger. Um, remember these guys serving as sort of the local act on the vaudeville show, you know? So they would come out and entertain the crowd before the, professional, before the professionals took over. Jeffrey O'Hara. He wrote the old songs. Those good old songs for me. I'll talk more about that. He was a singer. He was actually a recording artist, composer, lecturer. Here's a couple of songs he wrote. K -K -K Katie. Give a man a horse he can ride. It's a little more formal type of a song, solo song. My brother sang that in a music, you know, a choral contest, solo contest in high school. And in 1921, he wrote a medley of songs called A Little Close Harmony, part song for men's voices. You can see that it's written in TTBB form. Not a lot of barbershop was written down. That, that male quartet arrangements that were written down were written down in the form often that I showed you on Shine On Me. You would buy a piece of sheet music and on the back cover would be the male quartet arrangement. So it would be written TTBB form, okay? But not for staffs, it would be on two staffs. Okay, so notice that this is the old songs exactly as we know it. And then it launches into a sequence of plantation songs. But uh, I find interesting this little footnote down here, which I blew up here, which says, this arrangement for men's voices is frankly intended to faithfully reproduce and preserve that quaint American invention known as the swipe. <laughs> That's the first use of that term that I know of. But he, he may not mean what we mean because he puts in parentheses barbershop harmony. These few samples were not composed but were heard and jotted down by Mr. O'Hara at various times. Consecutive fifths and other grammatical errors are as heard. <laughs> now I think that's significant. And why it's significant is because he was certainly a, a knowledgeable and trained musician. Okay, he also knew he was dealing with an indigenous, legitimate type of music. And he had the good sense to know that any kind of music that's worth, worth being heard and sung had the right to form its own rules. So he said, he's indicating it's perfectly okay that parallel fifths and octaves other, quote, grammatical errors, other things your music theory teacher would put a red X beside if you turn it in, are acceptable because this is what we do. Parallelism is all over the place in our music. We don't shy away from it at all. So I think that's pretty significant. So you notice it was 1921 and he was using the term barbershop. Um, Another very famous man, Sigmund Spaeth, author, musicologist, and lecturer. Wrote lots of books. If you, ever, you can get his books on Amazon.com. If you fish around on the internet, you can find. They're no longer in print, but you can find copies of them. They're just great books, and they're all about musical Americana, you know. Um, he was just very interested in popular music of all types. And 
he wrote in 1925 a very significant book. It was called Barbershop Ballads, a book of close harmony. So you notice he uses the term barbershop and he also uses the term close harmony. And there are some really amusing things. He writes very tongue in cheek. But he does lay out what he thinks barbershop is and he includes in the book a number of arrangements of barbershop songs. Most of them are old songs, meaning songs that come from the 1800s. You will find no Tin Pan Alley songs in Sigmund Space book. There are some quite significant things here. Keep in mind, again, this is a very trained musician. He was a Princeton PhD. Barbershop harmony is obviously vocal rather than instrumental. And when it is remembered that barbers were originally surgeons as well, perhaps a barbershop chord is, after all, merely one which mutilates or dresses up some conventional formula of music. Its harmony tugs and strains in every direction, just as ragtime and its jazz offspring rip orthodox melody and rhythm into tatters. <laughs> I think that is the most significant paragraph you'll read in this class, to tell you the truth. Because it is a musician saying what Barbershop does. And he is absolutely right. He is absolutely right. We use conventional chord progression, but we also use very unconventional chord progression. I lament the fact that we've taken the seventh chords, the tonic seventh chords, out of heart of my heart. I noticed when we were singing it this morning, nobody does it the right way anymore. Okay, so we have young generation people, we're going to sing it the right way. Sing heart of my heart. What do we have? A flat? Mm, here we go. That's the way heart of my heart was when I got into barbershop. So those seventh chords got taken out because somebody said, well, back in the days of cleaning it up, one seven, Roman numeral one seven shouldn't go to six seven. That doesn't follow the circle of fifths. But in the other case, one seven goes back to one. But that's what. It's harmony, tugs and strains in every direction. Beautiful that way. So, all of you young folks, go out and teach the world heart of my heart. So wait, bare toes. Faces stay across, bare toes down. Go down a half. And say, you'll be mine. Bare tones go up an octave. It gives an augmented chord. Somebody decided that wasn't a good chord. Okay. Now, there's more funny stuff in this. Um, I love this, this paragraph right here. Actually, barbershop ballads constitute a game at which any number can play. If four parts are not available, some good effects can be secured with three. And in a pinch, a single lusty tenor singing above a sustained melody will either create the impression of harmony or compel immediate expulsion. <laughs> <laughs> the typical tenor of a quartet seems always on the verge of tears. He wallows in pathos. And this is really his happiness, so don't worry about his facial expression. It's the harmony that counts. <laughs> it is too much to expect a baritone or first bass to sing always by ear, for this is the most difficult part to fill. But it is quite probable that a number of baritones are right in your midst with at least the potentiality of harmonizing as this book suggests. When such a divinely gifted individual is not available, you can get along temporarily without him. And when he finally turns up, the joy will be all the greater. He will be recognized by the benignity of his countenance, especially when in action. And after he has filled in a few harmonies, there will be no mistaking his class. Look at this. There's an asterisk somewhere up there. For the sake of convenience, the second tenor who consistently carries the melody will be called the lead. The term tenor will apply only to the first or high tenor, 
And bass will mean the second or low bass, while the first bass will be known as the baritone. So he is codifying the names for the parts that we use. I won't say that's the first time because the old African-American reference is definitely referred to singing lead, okay, and it was the second tenor, but he's making it clear that that's the terminology he's going to use, and by the time the Barbershop Harmony Society got going, those are the terms that we used. You notice they were not used on Glenn Howard's quartet card. He said uh, tenor one, tenor two, baritone and basso, all right, so it's kind of a hybrid. Oh, and I should say that uh, one more thing about Sigmund Space book. That book is a real gem. When the society started, it was viewed as the handbook. There was no C and J manual or anything <coughs> like that. So people were referred to Sigmund Space book to find out what barbershop harmony is. And Spaeth was a member of the early society. Okay, the Wheaties Quartet throwback. This is late twenties. Late 20s, barbershop quartet, male quartet, was a beginning to be a thing of the past. So we're probably a decade away from barbershop quartets being prominent and popular recording artists, for example. Uh, but the Wheaties Quartet was quite famous. Wave the flag, perhaps, and high, boys. Show them how we stand. Ever shall it be champions. Merge us together several land. different commercials so Wheaties, you hear quality Wheaties, Breakfast changes. of Champions, bring you the thrilling adventures of Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Man, Some of us actually remember this. I don't know this. of any other dish that packs so much flavor and satisfaction as a heaping big bowl of Wheaties. <laughs> Have you tried Obviously Wheaties? Obviously a different recording. They're whole wheat with all of the bread. Musical advertising. 